warning contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. So for this week's Fearful Symmetry Friday, I was going to use this video here between Alex and Paul Vanderclay as a jumping off point into William Blake's poetry itself and then Northrop Fry's commentary on it. Um, so let's let's just start right away uh, because this is, this is going to take a while because there's quite a lot to get to here with the uh, conversation he's having with with Paul Vanderclay. I guess I would like to know. Okay. And what do you That's mean you... by what do you mean by knowing? What does that feel like? What does that look like? So there so there's a you know there, there's different kind of types of truth right. Um, you know, there's the metaphorical truth and there's like the more the literal truth. Yeah. Like I would like to know that literal truth. Okay. So it's one thing, you know, that, um, you know, consciousness is a little bit of a bugger because I can't, uh, out, in a naturalistic framework, I can't, I can't justify it. I can't find a way to make it seem um, plausible. Okay. Like I can almost get to the point, almost, not quite that there's some, you know, handsome bag of meat out there named Alex running around, you know, doing all his crazy antics. Like I can almost see that being a reality, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in on its own accord. Mm -hmm. The fact that I am here right now observing it and pondering on it, mm -hmm. that's something different entirely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And something your dog doesn't do. It's I don't think so. No, no, I don't think I, so either. That's, that's why he's my dog is sitting thing. over there. Yeah, my answer, he's right around the corner. Like at, like in his private parts, you know, just just waiting for the next thing. But but you're self aware and you're self conscious and you're you've just talked about yourself in a way that your dog could never do. Well, and maybe that's just mental capacity, and uh, and I'm not so sure about the separation between us and animals. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm uh, I think that there's a very convincing argument about you know that the fact that we're having a conversation such as this right now, mm -hmm. you know, that our dog can't, but maybe that's just mental capacity too. Yeah. You know, like, um, you know, in all probability, you know, like I was, it seems like I was more uh, just almost infinitely more probable to be an earthworm or something like that, you know, and not who I am. I'm going to take this places that he, of course, was not meaning to go with that statement. I just thought it was an, it was interesting how he used the exact same words here about a worm. Um, and uh, I'm going to use a little bit of a preface here. So in case you're not too familiar with William Blake's epic poems, this little preface to the poems kind of gives you the lay of the land, so to speak, on some of the things I'm going to be getting into uh, with the poetry and with Northrop Fry, who again is sort of writing it with, you know, with the expectation that you will have read the poems beforehand. But I know that's not the case with many of the people listening to these videos. So I thought this little preface, uh, it's just a, a paragraph here that will get you into it a little bit faster. And then I'll go to the poetry itself, and then I'll go to Northrop Fry um, and his his explanations. So th this is a little bit about uh, Blake's conception of the pre-fall of the world and then a little bit of the fall and, and what that means and so forth. The imagination was the bride of the Lamb of God, happy in many lovely and innocent ways, and every idea of man was the, quote, child of Jesus and his bride, end quote, in the religion of forgiveness, refusing to impute sin. But the peace was is broken. The intellectual powers are busied with the western region of bodily things, and in particular the sense of the tongue, through which came the first sin. And man falls into the sleep that we call the life of the body, shadowed by the tree of mystery, and passing from inspired religion to that false faith, which demands bodily instead of mental sacrifice. He enters into mortal sorrow, and his hard rational power, called by Blake, Satan, separates itself from his loins, the place of judgment, and furiously enforces its legal morality. By this separation, the imagination also is forced to depart, and passing eastward through more emotionalism, it is lost in grief. Further and further, the reason asserts its dominion 
over the emotional life and the happiness of man become stained with sensuality. In every phase of mental life, the place of the imagination is restricted and the power itself is forced into the dark land of corporeal life. By such a system of religion, man is convinced of his own mortality, equaling himself with the worms. But nothing can wholly obscure the glory of the divine within him. Even in the weakness and transience of the life between birth and death, this state is common to all mankind, and the poet identifies himself with the man who, whose fall he has narrated and calls on the Lamb of God, the divine image whom he crucified, but who still makes his perpetual appeal to the heart of man. He implores him to mold the spiritual and to repress the merely rational life with the love and fear of God. For the reason is to be mastered, not to be abandoned, in all its selfish cruelty and pride of intellectual war, it is still a true part of man, even when it tries to claim that its own children, the logical ideas, have alone the right to exist, though such a system is bound at last to be its own destruction. The true life knows no compulsion, but consists in mutual acceptance and forgiveness, for so can man be joined with man to build up Christianity the religion of the imagination. So I'm not sure which one to read first, actually. I, it, you know, the poetry... I'll just read the, the poetry. It, it is just a, like a paragraph long, so it'll give you a little bit more of an idea of um, how William Blake draws a lot of his symbolism and imagery from the Bible. I think he's drawing from Ephesians or Isaiah or something in here. Um, and thus the shadowy female howls in articulate howlings, quote, I will lament over Milton in the lamentations of the afflicted. My garments shall be woven of sighs and heartbroken lamentations. The misery of unhappy families shall be drawn out into its border, wrought with the needle, with dire sufferings, poverty, pain, and woe. Along the rocky island and thence throughout the whole earth, there shall be the sick father and his starving family. There, the prisoner in the stone dungeon and the slave at the mill. I will have writings written all over it in human words that every infant that is born upon the earth shall read and get by rote as a hard task of life of sixty years. I will have kings enwoven upon it, and counselors and mighty men. The famine shall clasp it together with buckle and clasps, and the pestilence shall be its fringe, and the war its girdle. To divide into Rahab and Tirzah, that Milton may come to our tents. For I will put on the human form, and take the image of God, even pity and humanity. But my clothing shall be cruelty, and I will put on holiness as a breastplate and as a helmet, and all my ornaments shall be of the gold of broken hearts and the precious stones of anxiety and care and desperation and death and repentance for sin and sorrow and punishment and fear to defend me from thy terrors, O Orc, my beloved. Albion's specter from his loins tore forth in all the pomp of war. Satan his name, in flames of fire he stretched his druid pillars far, Jerusalem fell from Lambeth's Vale, down through Poplar and Old Bow, through Maiden and across the sea, in war and howling, death and woe. The Rhine was red with human blood, the Danube rolled at purple tide. On the Euphrates Satan stood, and over Asia stretched his pride. He withered up sweet Zion's hill. From every nation of the earth he withered up Jerusalem's gates, and in a dark land gave her birth. He withered up the human form by laws of sacrifice for sin till it became a mortal worm, but, oh, translucent all within. The divine vision still was seen, still was the human form divine, weeping and weak in mortal clay, O oh, Jesus, still the form was thine. And thine the human face, and thine the human hands and feet and breath, entering through the gates of birth and passing through the gates of death. And, O oh, thou Lamb of God, whom I slew in my dark self-righteous pride, art thou returned to Albion's land, and in Jerusalem thy bride? Come to my arms and never more depart, but dwell forever here. Create my spirit to thy love, subdue my specter to thy fear. Specter of Albion, warlike fiend, in clouds of blood and ruin rolled. Here reclaim thee as my own, my selfhood, Satan armed in gold. Is this thy soft family love, thy cruel patriarchal pride, planting thy family alone, destroying all the world beside? 
A man's worst enemies are those of his own house and family, and he who makes his law a curse by his own hand shall surely die. In my exchanges every land shall walk, and mine in every land mutual shall build Jerusalem both heart in heart and hand in hand. If humility is Christianity, you, O Jews, are the true Christians. Tormented with sweet desire for these beauties of Albion, they would never love my power if they did not seek to destroy any Tharman. Vela would never have sought and loved Albion if she had not sought to destroy Jerusalem. Such is that false and generating love, a pretense of love to destroy love, cruel hypocrisy unlike the lovely delusions of Beulah, and cruel forms unlike the merciful forms of Beulah's night. They know not why they love, nor wherefore they sicken and die, calling that holy love which is envy, revenge, and cruelty, which separated the stars from the mountains, the mountains from man, and left man a little groveling root outside of himself. Negations are not contraries, contraries mutually exist. But negations exist not, exceptions and objections and unbeliefs exist not, nor shall they ever be organized for ever and ever. If thou separate from me, thou art a negation, a mere reasoning and derogation from me, an objecting and cruel spite and malice and envy. But my emanation, alas, will become my contrary. O thou negation, I will continually compel thee to be invisible to any but whom I please, and when and where and how I please, and never, never shalt thou be organized. But as a distorted and reversed reflection in the darkness, and in the non-entity. Nor shall that which is above ever descend into thee, but thou shalt be a non-entity forever. And if any enter into thee, thou shalt be an unquenchable fire, and he shall be a never-dying worm, mutually tormented by those that thou tormentest, a hell and despair forever and ever. So I thought that was some basic, some of the little basic quotes from Blake's epic poems to get into this section of Northrop Fry's Fearful Symmetry. So you have just a little bit of a, a background, um, you know, ever so slight, because these, these poems are hundreds of pages of lo long. But this is, um, this is chapter five, The Word Within the Word, and it's part eight. And we're going to go over what is Satan. That's the opening question. But what is Satan? In the human mind, he is the death impulse, or selfhood, which reduces men to becoming either death-dealing tyrants or torpid and inert victims of them. He is the accuser, or principle of unbelief, which makes tyrants revengeful and victims terrified. This mutual interaction of revenge and terror being the basis of fallen society in this world, Satan is therefore the objective counterpart of the death impulse, the dead body or inert matter for which the most direct symbols are rock and sand. Yet matter is superior to chaos, and chaos to non-entity. The fact that physical death does not sink below matter must represent part of the same stabilizing of existence which is represented by the, quote, mundane shell and the body of Adam. Adam is the, quote, limit of contraction, end quote, and Satan is the, quote, limit of opacity, end quote. Adam and Satan, therefore, are the bounds put to the fall in life and death, respectively. Hell, the abode of Satan, is Ulro, the world of abstractions, which in aggregate are matter, nature, reason, and memory. In generation, subject and object are in a relation which appears in Beulah more clearly as that of male and female or lover and beloved. Hence, Satan is described by Blake as, quote, hermaphrodite, end quote, a sterile fusion of subject and object into an indivisible abstract or spectral world. The biblical account of the fall and the story of Adam and Eve presents us with the two, quote, druidic symbols of the tree and the serpent. Serpent worship is, like human sacrifice, part of the psychology of the fall. The serpent with its tail in its mouth is a perfect emblem of the selfhood, an earthbound, cold-blooded, and often venomous form of life, imprisoned in its own cycle of death and rebirth. As for the tree, there were two trees in paradise, the tree of eternal life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The former represents the unity of man with God, 
The account in Genesis seems to imply, though we shall look at it again, an abstract or superhuman God who, said to, who is said to be jealous of man and expels him from Eden to prevent him from reaching for that tree. The restoration of the tree of life to man is therefore one of the features of the apocalypse. The water of life, symbolized in the Bible by the four rivers of Eden, which actually are the four senses of unfallen man, is also to be given freely to man after the last day. The other tree symbolizes several different aspects of the selfhood. It is a tree of mor morality, conveying the knowledge that one lives a good life in a bad world by using the minimum of imagination. It is a symbol of nature, of the separate objective body of generation which Blake always associates with the vegetable world. In the ninth book of Paradise Lost, after Eve has eaten of the apple, she bows to the tree and does it homage. There, in the worship of the external spirit, is the beginning and end of all idolatry. But above all, this upas tree of death, which lost man paradise symbolizes mystery, the elusiveness of the object. This aspect of it, though presented as a different tree, is beautifully brought out in Milton's ban banyan, which continually enroots itself in the earth, spreading a dense vegetable thicket wider and wider as it grows. When Adam and Eve shrink into the banyan grove to conceal and cover their fallen bodies, they are symbolically still in front of the tree of mystery. The growth of this tree is described in, quote, the human abstract, which ends, The gods of the earth and sea sought through nature to find this tree, but their search was all in vain. There grows one in the human brain. In this larger symbolic form, the tree appears in northern mythology as the world ash Idrisil. It was the serpent that tempted Adam to fall. It is not called the devil until much later. And the serpent then fell himself. But as Adam and Blake is the, is the present human body which was established after a gigantic period, the serpent must, among other things, symbolize the fallen body of man. The serpent body, forced to the ground to eat dust and clay, is the constricted body of the natural man. The serpent's ability to shed its skin, on the other hand, makes it an emblem of death and rebirth, the persistence of the, quote, living form as a species in time. There is no explicit association in Genesis between the bodies of Adam and Eve and that of the serpent, but there is a suggestive hint of one in Paradise Lost which may have attracted Blake's notice, quote, As when he washed his servant's feet, so now as father of his family he clad their nakedness with skins of beast or slain, or as the snake with youthful coat repaid. Orc, or human imagination trying to burst out of the body, is often described as a serpent bound on the tree of mystery, Dependent upon, dependent upon it, yet struggling to get free. The erection of the brazen serpent in the wilderness bef therefore represents in disguised form the more clearly symbolic story of the earlier poem. The energy of Orc, which broke away from Egypt, was perverted into the Sinaitic mortal, moral code, and this is symbolized by the nailing of Orc in the form of a serpent to a tree. This was a prototype of the crucifixion of Jesus, and the crucifixion, the image of divine visionary power bound to a natural world symbolized by a tree of mystery, is the central symbol of the fallen world. Parallel to the image of the crucified Christ is the figure of Prometheus chained to a rock, imagination bound to Ulro. Both titans were victims of Zeus Jehovah, or Eurizen, and both are allotropic forms of Orc. Jesus redeems Adam in generation. The Promethean fire will burn the opaque world to ashes in the final consummation. Some idea of this serpent symbolism seems to underlie the Gnostic cult of the Ophites who worshipped the serpent as Jesus and considered Jehovah an evil being. Now if the fall of the serpent symbolizes the fall of Adam, or rather the fall of humanity to the Adamic form, the serpent before its fall must represent the Druid culture which preceded Adam. That culture, in its dying stages, was a period of ferocious war accompanied by prodigies of human sacrifice. It was the tyrannical side of the selfhood run rampant. There were no quiescent victims, for human beings were still too strong. There were only sacrificed captives. The unfallen serpent, then, would not be a scaly and shiny reptile, nor even the curious miltonic animal that slides around on its rear, but a creature of terrible strength and beauty, like the tiger, its scales glittering precious stones, its head crested with gold, the image of tyrannical pride, like Milton's Satan, when his form had not yet lost all her original brightness. 
And it, in th it is this serpent, man's selfhood or desire to assert, rather than create, that stands between man and paradise. The cherub, with the flaming sword who guards the tree of life, therefore, is the demonic, quote, serpent. The account in Genesis does not suggest this, but Ezekiel, in denouncing the king of Tyre, makes the identification and relates the king's tyranny to it. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, and the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. End quote. The Greeks have preserved the memory of this covering cherub in their myth of the Hesperides, the paradisal islands of the west under the domain of Atlas, where a myster mysterious tree with golden fruits is guarded by a dragon. The fallen serpent is a worm, 70 inches long, lasting for 60 winters. The demonic serpent, or covering cherub, is a dragon. The former is the helplessness of the victim, the latter the ferocity of the tyrant. But the dragon, in the Bible and elsewhere, is a symbol of something far worse than Satan, the, quote, limit of opacity. He is a symbol of the chaos which underlies it, waiting to burst in and overwhelm the entire cosmos. For the dragon in all mythologies is simply a conventional form of the monstrous, the unreal, the fire-breathing terror, which the hero makes tangible only by killing. All monsters in heroic literature are, like Grendel, sprung from the race of Cain, or the death impulse. But much more hideous than this is the horror of something mysterious and undefined, the power of darkness. The creation of the fallen world is an act of mercy, because the stability and permanence of the dead inorganic world forms a barrier between our weak struggling lives and the total annihilation of all being in chaos. Now, there's a lot more that I would like to read, but this video is going a little bit longer than I expected for my Friday night. And so I'm going to end the reading from Fearful Symmetry right there. But um, I hope you can put all the pieces together, and it's not too uh, much uh, gibberish uh, for you to understand what's going on here. And I thought how natural it was for Alex, an engineer who is probably very mathematical and... Um, if you saw, I don't know if I, I, now I can't remember exactly how much of the answer I played, but he wants to know what's real, not metaphorically real, but, you know, let's say actually real, right? And this is very interesting. This is very left hemisphere. I would suggest he reads uh, Ian McGilchrist, The Master and His Emissary, because he did ask Paul for some books to read. And this may not be exactly where he wants to go with this, but I think it's essential if you're going to understand uh, Jordan Peterson and, I don't know, further your understanding of, of yourself and of your reality. Um, but so he goes with this kind of mathematical your reason. This is the Blake's your reason. And he comes down to the fact of, of acknowledging that I could have otherwise been just a worm. You know, that, that, that what, is this, what is this consciousness I am? What is this human being that I am? Of all the things that are probable, this is the most improbable. And, you know, he has, of course, he has different layers of meaning when he's saying this. And I'm just taking the literalness of it, the worm part, and bringing it into this Blake stuff because Blake talks about it as human beings as a worm. And this is what, the, this is what your reason, Blake's, um, Blake's God of, of logic and reason, kind of teaches you. And this is what the specter of man, his shadow side, is always kind of telling him in logic and reason through Darwin that you are just a worm that you're not a man. And so then there's a struggle between man's animalness and his divinity. And here Alex says he's not you know, too sure about the, the clear distinction between uh, man and animal and, and divine and, 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 and so forth. And you know, I totally relate to that. And there's, there's something to that. 
and this is perhaps our greatest struggle in, in our, for our modern minds to understand this, that there is a division. And something that struck me, maybe there's more to play here, and then I'll, I might comment more on it. I don't know if I played it yet. Two, you know, but... You couldn't be anything else other than who you are. I maybe mean, we, not. Often, we often play this... Oh, yes, they were talking about how you couldn't be any, anything else other than who you are. I think... This doesn't pertain exactly to their conversation, but to other people like that I've seen, like Sam Harris and so forth, who are all about reason and logic and philosophy and this sort of very ordered way of thinking. I think they they really they perhaps think that way because they're around professors and university students and like-minded people. But if you are around people who are broken, and there's a lot of ways to be broken, um, I am particularly around people who are uh, have mental illness and um, various brain injuries. So their brains are not working right. Uh, they are, as human beings, quote, not working right. They're, there's something disordered in their minds and they can't function, uh, at least not, not well by themselves. And I've seen some very, very, I don't know how to describe it. The things I've seen make you really understand the machinery that exists in your brain to make you who you are and when something goes wrong with that when the wires are crossed so to speak you're not going to be the same person and you're not going to be this divine image of God you're going to be like a broken robot bumping into a wall over and over again or you're, you're going to be standing at the door like a zombie because you don't know how to open the door. You don't know what the handle is for. And so you can just stand there and you're not going to move. You have a desire to go through the doorway, but because the door is closed, you're just going to stand there. Now, it look, this person looks like a human being. And they're made in the image of God. And now here you have to take your religious beliefs and, and philosophies and apply it to what you're seeing and overlay it there and say... That's a human being that's sacred. It's a very, very tough problem, though. When, and I, I'm very interested to see the, the next um, unbelievable video segment. I know I saw the teaser videos uh, last night, I think. And they're talking about um, children born with you know, horrible diseases and euthanasia for them. And you know, I, it's, a very, it's a tough question. Um, and and I, you know, I, I'm very familiar with both sides of the debate. But it's still a tough question for me um, as to what you do with with these types of people and how you treat them. And there's a whole lot of there's a whole lot of layers there um, that you have to get into. And I, I don't think you really understand it until you have extensive experience um, with the broken people, as well as the people who are quote not broken. And again, these are you know when you say broken and unbroken. Again, there's many ways to be broken and, and, and not broken and more whole and more and more uh, healed uh, spiritually and physically. There's, there's a whole continuum. I think there's a whole continuum. When you start having experiences, probably like Paul Vanderclay does, like a pastor typically does with a whole broad range of people, not just little cliques like a university clique or with me, I'm around a lot of mentally ill people. When you start to uh, have a broader range of exposure to all kinds of people, from, from the bottom of the continuum, if you want to say bottom, from one end, let's say, to the other end of the continuum of people, you see that there, there's just such a broad range that the form of a human being and the human soul can have. Uh, it, it's, it's quite astounding. And then to say that you know, there's just one way of being human or one type of, 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 of expression of consciousness I've seen a whole lot of different expressions of consciousness in the human form that there's just a, an enormous spectrum um, that I think the average person is not aware of. And they could be aware of, I guess, if they, if they start to research it, but it's hard to get the, the hands-on experience and to really viscerally experience the whole spectrum of human consciousness um, to give yourself that, that kind of... Uh, experiential knowledge but I think I've, I've gone on a little bit long enough and um, I think you, the, the poetry speaks for itself you can't really condense that and, and extract from it something more than what's already said in the poetry so I'm going to leave that alone 
And again, if you like these sort of uh, videos, uh, please hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you.